In this video, I'm gonna show you guys how to set up a traditional array and a ZFS pool with an Unraid on your link station in one. Let's get started. For this build, we'll be using two 2.5 inch, two terabyte Seagate Barracuda hard drives. To install the drives, we simply need to remove the two sleds from the enclosure. Then place both hard drives into their own sleds and secure them with the included screws. With the hard drives now secure, we can take the sleds and slide them back into the enclosure and then we'll be ready to move on to the next part of installing our NVMe drives. To install these four Samsung 1TB NVMe drives, we will need to remove the lids that act as heat sinks which cover the NVMe slots. Once we do that, we can insert each of the four drives and remove the plastic film that protects the thermal pads and finally replace the locking lids over the NVMe drives. Now we can get our link station powered as well as plugging it into our router and or switch so that way we can access it from the local network. Then we press the power button on the front and listen for a beep letting us know that it is in fact powered on. With everything plugged in, we can now use our favorite browser to find the server. And so if we type in tower.local, it should bring us to this page. The default username is root and the default password is 123456. And that will get us logged into our new server. The first thing that we're going to do and that you should do is change the default password. And to do that, you're just gonna click on users and click on the root account. So I'd highly, highly recommend changing the default password of 123456 to something else. Uh, literally anything else will, will be fine. Something that you can remember. Oh. If I can type and now that we have a easy to remember password or something that we can use, we're just going to have to log in with that one time. Now that the password has changed and we're back in, we're going to immediately go over to the hamburger here and we're going to do check for updates and we're going to say, yes, view the change log to start the update process. We could review this. This is actually good information here. If you need to know what changes are being made from previously to now, We'll go ahead and hit continue. We're gonna update from 6.12.9. I think this is an important step to do. Just go ahead and get it upgraded to the latest and greatest version. So that way, when we start configuring things, we have all of the features that we need. All right, so the update was successful. So now we are just going to reboot our server by clicking on this icon up here or button up here, and then now clicking this button. And the server's gonna reboot. And then when it comes back up, we will continue. Now that the N1 is rebooted, we can again go to tower.local to log in using our new credentials. And we're logged in. The first thing I'd like to do is personalize my server by giving it a name. So I'm gonna change the server name here from tower to N1 NAS. And for the description, this will technically be a media server, but I don't wanna leave the default name or description for media server. So I'm going to change it to my NAS. And for model, I'm going to change it to link station in one. Click apply. We just need to wait for the page to accept our changes and refresh, and it will prompt us to log back in. As you can see, our changes have been made. Let's just go ahead and get logged in once again with the default credentials. The next thing I want to do is head over back to settings, and I'm going to go to network settings. Now it's okay if you use DHCP because we can obviously type in n1nas.local, but sometimes I don't like the IP addresses that my DHCP server gives. And I wanna have a static IP address of something I can remember just in case n1nas.local doesn't work for some reason. So I'm gonna change this to 10.10.10.11, which is a unique IP address that is currently unused by any other computer on my network. And I'm also going to leave the rest of this default. You could change these parameters here for your DNS server to um, just using Cloudflare or Google or whomever. It doesn't really matter. Um, but you can see that I have three options here. But again, this is just optional. So let's go ahead and apply here. And now that our server has made that change, we will once again have to log in. Now that we're logged back in, one of the other things that I would recommend doing from this point is going over to apps and installing the Community Applications plugin. This will come in handy later when we go to install some containers. So we will need to get this installed. And yes, we understand that this is third-party additions to Unraid and not from Unraid themselves. And this is also being a service provided by Docker or these containers provided by Docker. So with this installed, uh, let's now go ahead and install the connect plugin. 
So this is from Unraid Official themselves. So we'll click on install here. And what this will allow us to do is um, do cloud backups. So we can back up our flash storage device to Unraid servers. So let's go ahead and click on actions and go to settings. From here, what we're gonna wanna do is sign in with our unraid.net account. Now, I'm already logged into unraid.net, so for me, this is what it brings up, but all you have to do is enter in your credentials if prompted. So I'm just gonna click on confirm here, and now I am successfully signed in with my user account. Now that we're signed in, we can use Unraid Connect's handy tool of backing up our flash to the cloud. This could come in handy in the future just in case we break something or make some modifications to the operating system and it will allow us for an easy recovery in the future. This is a really cool free feature that Unraid offers. And so I highly recommend taking advantage of it while we can. Great, so that seems to be activated and up to date. So we don't need to do anything from here unless we want to connect or allow remote access via Unraid Connect. You can do that if you'd like. We're gonna skip out on it on for this video just to keep the length of this video down. However, we can see that we are connected to the Unraid Connect beta. And if we really wanted to, we could go to Unraid Connect site and see that the N1 NAS is listed. And if we were to click on details, we can see that a flash backup was done on April 26th of this year. So that is the one that I just currently did. And then I can also see that I have a basic key currently on my Unraid device. All right, so let's go back to our Unraid server and then continue configuring it from here. To set up our traditional array, we'll click on the main tab here and that'll bring us to this page that you see. And what we'll do is we'll scroll down and actually reduce the number of drives shown because we only have two hard drives. So what we'll do is we'll set one to be our parity disk and then another to be the actual storage drive. That way, if we do lose one of these disks, they can always rebuild one another. Next, let's, we're gonna click on add pool and we're gonna leave this as cache, but we're gonna say that we need four slots. Click on add. And then we're just gonna go ahead and start assigning our NVMe drives to this cache pool. Now that all four drives are assigned, what we're gonna to wanna to do from here is actually click on cache. And then we're going to change the file system type to ZFS. Now this is gonna give us a couple of options of what ZFS RAID type we'd like. I think my preferred type in this case will be either a RAID Z1 or a RAID Z2. RAID Z2 is more fault tolerant and has two parity blocks and two data blocks from a single piece of information. Whereas RAID Z1 is a single parity setup and is not as fault tolerant, however, does have more performance than RAID Z2. For my setup, I'm gonna select RAID Z1 because I want to maximize my performance. From here, we'll go ahead and hit apply. And now that that's been applied, we can hit done. And we've created a ZFS cache pool for our array. So now what we're gonna go ahead and do is click on start. Yes, we'd like to proceed. And we're just gonna let this load so it can get the array started. And we're probably gonna to have to format some of these drives. All right, so let's just go ahead and say, yes, I want to format these drives. We'll hit format and then we'll let this sit for a little while and our array is pretty much good to go. With the formatting complete and our parity sync completed as well, we can move on to the next part of creating some actual shares that we're gonna need for containers in the upcoming parts of this video. So the first one that we're gonna create is going to be called data. So we'll call it data and we're actually gonna change the primary storage over to cache. And then where the second door, secondary storage will be array. So then all our new files will live on the cache and then be moved to the array later. So we'll just hit add share, click on done. And we're basically gonna repeat these same steps for the next few shares that we create. So again, we'll say it lives on the cache, then gets moved to the array, click on add, done. We'll add another share. This one will be called import, also lives on the cache get moved to the array. Now we'll add movies. And for movies, we're gonna do something a little bit different. We're actually gonna leave it on the primary storage as the array. So that way any movies will actually get read and stored on the array. And we don't care too, too much about performance. 
for this device as we're only going to be the only ones using it. So we hit add share. We're going to add another share. This one's going to be called pictures. And for pictures, we're also going to use the primary storage of the array so that way everything's nice and safe on there. And we'll click add share. Done. And finally, the last share we're going to add is going to be TV shows. And this one will also live on the array and we're not going to have secondary storage for it. And we'll click add share. And now we're done. Let's go ahead and install our first container. Let's click on apps here. And the first container we're going to install is going to be called Photo Prism. So we'll give that a search. Click on install here for that container. We're pretty much going to leave everything default, but we are going to make just a handful of changes. So our storage path for our actual pictures, we created that earlier, and that's under mount user pictures. And then we're going to have an import folder as well. That can be useful in the future for actually importing uh, photos. We're going to say offensive uploads. We'll just leave it as true. This is allow uploads that may be offensive. Uh, flag offensive photos. False. Website title. We're going to call it uncast. Ow. Portfolio. Caption. Will be where dreams were made. These, these are all optional, by the way. You don't have to do this, but I'm going to do it. Website description. Um, SPX Labs is cool. Is great, I mean. Author, we're going to say SPX Labs. I cannot type. Uh, you could set a password here if you wanted to. So if this is going to be like on the open internet, you may want to set a password. Uh, for now, I'm actually going to delete this. We're going to have our ours as public so we can just easily access it. Um, so I'm going to hit on remove and we're going to create a new key so that way we can actually make this public. This part is very important because if you do not do it, you will not be able to access your um, Photo Prism app. So we're going to give this a name of ooh, Photo Prism public. Our key is going to be photo prism underscore public. The value will be true. Default value will also be true. And we'll click on add. All right. And those are all the changes we're going to make. If you do click on advanced view, there are going to be some more options in here. And if you also do show set show more settings there are going to be a ton more options my recommendation would not be to touch any of this stuff unless you absolutely know what you're doing or working on and uh, i'm just gonna leave everything as default so we'll hit on apply and we'll wait for this download this container to download and get installed and then we'll configure it all right it is done and installed so we're gonna click on done let's go over to docker go to web ui and you can see that there are no currently no pictures found that's okay, that's to be expected because this is brand new. We could upload pictures if we wanted to. So let's go to pictures. Let's grab some photos here. Get those all uploaded. Upload complete. So let's go to folders and we can see some pictures in May of 2024. And uh, here are some photos. <laughs> all right, easy peasy. Right, so we got those photos uploaded. Let's look at how to upload photos a slightly different way. So we created that folder earlier in our shares that was called import. So let's go ahead and actually share this or export it so that we can put folders in there and then then be imported into our photo prism container. So we'll let this sit for a minute and it should become available. Now I'm going to look on my network and look for N1 NAS. And the import folder is public and available. So let's drag some photos into there. From here, let's go to library, click on import, and then click on import again. And that should be importing, yep, it's importing on both of our pictures. So I believe now if we go back to folders, yep, we see two more pictures added to our collection here on April 24th. The next container we're going to install is called Jellyfin. And Jellyfin's great because we can actually take advantage of the Link Station's onboard graphics or iGPU, whatever you'd like to call it. So we're going to install Benhex's repository. Linux server repository would be good as well. I'm just going to do this one because I'm most familiar with it. 
The first thing I'm gonna do is just change this to advanced and we're gonna make sure we add in some extra parameters here so that we can use the onboard Intel iGPU to do all of our transcoding and encoding for our movies or TV or whatever media we might wanna play. So all we need to add in is dash dash device equals slash dev slash dry. So this is supposed to be driver, but dry is fine. And we will skip on down to the next part. We need to add our movies here. So we're gonna select movies and slash mount user movies. Okay, and we also have TV shows, so we need to add another path. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll give the path the name TV shows. You can call it whatever you'd like. We will do TV shows again. Our host path is gonna be TV shows. That auto fills for us, so we don't even have to think about it. And we're just gonna click on add. I think that pretty much adds everything we need to have. So let's just go ahead and hit apply here. And that'll download and get installed for us. And when that's done, we will come back to it and take a look. Okay, the container is done it being installed and is probably already running. So let's click on done here. We'll go back to Docker and we can see that's already started. That's good. We can probably get into the web UI and set it up. So let's go ahead and do that. Just click on next. You can give it a username and password if you'd like. Uh, I'm not gonna do that for this. I'm just gonna leave it open since it's on my network, but you can always come back and do it later. Uh, we can add some media. Uh, let's just say movies, display name movies. We have some folders to choose from. So the one, the base one that was called media, we mapped to movies. So we'll select that and we'll hit okay. And we will pretty much leave all of this other stuff as default settings. You can always modify this or change it as necessary. We're gonna add a second one for our TV shows. So we'll call it shows. Display name is shows is fine. Select TV shows like we did earlier, click okay. And we're just gonna leave all default settings. You can customize that later if you'd like. Click on next. Next again, allow remote connections to the server. This is kind of up to you if you'd rather, if you'd like to have remote connections or not, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna allow it just for funsies. We're all done, finish. Okay, so the default username was nobody, so we'll just sign in because there's no password. All right, we need to add some content to this so we can actually watch something. So let's go back to our shares and then let's go ahead and make these public. So export, yes, it's already public, apply. We'll click on done. And now we're gonna wanna do the same thing for movies. Export, yes, apply. Okay, now we just need to add some content. So here is my network shares with movies and TV shows. So let's just go ahead and paste in something. Now that we've dropped a movie in there, we can go back to Jellyfin and see that it's been populated. But just before we play it, we do want to do one more thing to make sure that our hardware acceleration is actually enabled. So we're gonna click on the hamburger menu over here, go to dashboard, we're gonna go to playback, and then we're gonna say where it says hardware acceleration, we're gonna select VAAPI, this is for Linux. And it auto-populated the render driver that we are gonna use for hardware acceleration, encoding, transcoding, all that stuff. So we know that this is actually working. And we're gonna go ahead and just select HEVC and AV1 just for funsies. And you can go through here and change more settings if you like, if you really wanna dive into that. That's not something this video is gonna cover. We're just simply setting it up for now. And actually, let's go all the way down and make sure we hit save. With our settings saved, we can now go back to our video and press play, and all of that should be working fine.